So we're going to now go to the final session. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, where we're going to talk about how we build captivating places, obviously, by creating spaces for artists like Elizabeth. Um, uh, and we're very pleased to have participants coming from various places to help us with this and to discuss this with us, with experience in cities, not just New York, but around um, the world. Uh, Donald Hislop was to be with us from the Tate Modern, but he had to have a surgical procedure. Uh, and so he couldn't be with us. But we have uh, an able uh, um, contention, including Elizabeth, who's going to come back. So would you welcome, please, Jamie Bennett from Art Place, um, Deborah Simon, the Vice President of Arts Brookfield, um, Elizabeth Streb, um, Daniel Tobin, and uh, Jorn Weisbrod. Where is Jorn? Yeah. Hello, Jorn. Lovely. Hi. <laughs> That's perfect. I thought um, that we would start by doing exactly what Elizabeth doesn't want us to do, which is to tell you what we're going to talk about <laughs> and then talk about it. Um, but in listening, in, in both in talking with uh, this extraordinary panel and in listening to the sessions earlier today, the sort of three themes that I heard that I'd love for us to sort of get a chance to reflect on in our comments is the theme around intentionality. And I think, Elizabeth, you sort of nailed it when you were using that London Olympic example, you and the mayor's office had very different intentions with what you were doing. You both ended up being interested in the same thing and wanting it to happen, but you sort of got there from very different places. There's the notion of what I'll call um, sort of poetically enlightened self-interest, which is I think many times how we get that intersection of arts and culture with um, private development. Um, and I think it's really whenever we can find something that helps us do more of what we want to do, and it also happens to be a good thing, that is probably the most powerful motivator in the world. And then there's something that I'd love to unpack because this is sort of the arts panel around the, the sort of necessary preconditions for this to work. And uh, it came up, I think, uh, with a colleague from um, Silverstein Properties who was talking about infrastructure. So there's that notion of sort of what is the infrastructure. I think each of you has done a project in a purpose-built space that is meant to have art in it, to have action in it. And each of you has done it in sort of non-purpose-built spaces, in the interstitial spaces, in the on sort the of escalators. corridors, on the escalators with the construction cams. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't want to take those necessarily in that order, but those are three things that were sort of very resonant for me. And we'll just sort of take advantage of the order we're in and we'll also give Elizabeth a chance um, to, to recover a little bit. But Deborah, and um, so I'm also just in terms of subject positions, I'm sort of thrilled that we have an artist or an action mechanic. I don't know how you're describing yourself these action days. Action specialist. Action specialist. Um, we have an artistic director of a festival. We have a curator at large um, and someone who sort of wanders the world curating at will. And we have an embedded curator, a sort of a double agent, um, who's a curator <laughs> embedded in a private developer. So I'm, I'm particularly excited by all of that. So Deborah, let me start with you. There are sort of many different moments that you could attach to one of the projects that you work on for Brookfield. And sometimes I'm assuming you can be brought in very early and sometimes you can be brought in more at the end as sort of a decorator. Talk a little bit about how, what is the difference it makes to your work when you're brought into a project? Well, I think what we do is we do a lot of talking about what we want the, the end product experience to be and how we want people to use our spaces. And I think it's worth noting that spaces are not just places for, for programming, but they have to be activated when nothing's happening. And how do you create the right kind of infrastructure by the right kind of furniture, the right kind of lighting to create places where you're not actually programming and they program themselves. But it really depends when we're doing a redevelopment, we're working with an existing building. So that can be a little trickier. When we're working with a new development, we sit down from the very beginning with the um, design and construction team internally and with the architects and we say, together we come up with a vision for the program and then I have a wonderful, I have a great production team, Elise Martin's here who oversees that. And we go in and then we do the nuts and bolts, saying if, you, if these are the areas you want activated, then we need 
literally, we need power, this much power, this is where we need power. We need to get a box truck truck on the plaza, so it has to hold this much weight. You want, we want truss and hang rigging points from here and here and here, and so, and to give us the most flexibility that you can, because we've really moved away from just everything happening, <coughs> as the stage is here and the audience is here. It's a much more immersive experience, so we want power and rigging everywhere so that we can allow our artists to have the largest amount of flexibility to create work they'd like to see done. And if I were to survey the C-suite at Brookfield, why would they say that you're on staff? I would say that Brookfield is a very visionary and forward-thinking company. And we were way ahead of the curve when in 1988, um, the, the predecessor company created the arts, uh, uh, the arts and events program at the World Financial Center, which was then the worldwide headquarters of Merrill Lynch and American Express to basically sort of create this new neighborhood hub, which was the center of Battery Park City. And it was really the indoor uh, living room of Battery Park City. And it was a very early mixed use between the, the, uh, the, the, the residential came later, but it was also giving the, the uh, first wave of tenants something to do, because it really was an island there. So I think it was, I think it was began as a form of entertainment that was focused mostly to the tenants and then very much through, through the visionary work of Anita Contini and Melissa Coley grew into something much bigger than that, which then, which became um, how we transform a neighborhood. It's not, we just don't think of how are we gonna make our building better, more valuable. It's really how are we gonna move the needle on this whole area and make this a place people wanna be. And so we can we continue in that in that methodology, and I and we did that very much by taking things off the stage and putting them, embedding them more in public space. That's awesome. Yarn, sort of building off of that, you're an artistic director. It's a very different setup for you, right? You are embedded as the artistic visionary of of is it the largest performing arts festival in the United in the in North no, America? No, I, I think we're the largest multidisciplinary. Um, largest multidisciplinary uh, arts, arts festival in, in North, in North America. America. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing that there are many things that have been talked about today that you don't think about in a given day, and you don't think a lot about commercial tenancy, and you don't think a lot about those sorts of things. And yet, you inhabit an entire city, right? When your festival comes on, you will do a performance for 10,000 people, thousands of people. You'll also do very intimate performances for small people. What, how are you approaching the city as an artistic director? How do you sort of begin thinking through what are we going to do in and with this city in, 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 this, in the festival that we have? Well, I think, I mean, the approach is really, for me, and I don't know if that's the right thing for this festival, but it is, I hope it is, um, it's the right thing for been. me per personally, is that I always start with the artist and I always start with the idea. I don't start with... Uh, you know, an atmosphere that I want to create or that I want the artist to create or a space that I want the artist to fill. I find that very difficult and, and uh, sort of unliberating. So I start with the artist and we develop an idea and then we sort of look for the space or for the right sort of way of, of presenting it. And you know, that's how we came to doing a, a project in a basement in, some, in, in, in a suburb of Toronto an hour away from downtown because this guy had built a train car, a, a via rail 1980s train car in his basement and we had two artists, a, a chef from Montreal and a musician who were both obsessed about trains and wanted to create this imaginary journey through music and food. Right. And um, so we found this guy's basement and that's where the project ended up happening. Um, and that's really how I, it was, it was great. It was very tasty too. And the problem actually was, one of the huge the problems tenancy. with this project was that we only later then found out that the, that the people who lived in the house were kosher. And, <laughs> and I mean religiously kosher. So the chef had to like completely relearn how to cook basically to make this event happen. But, um, the Governor General of Canada was there and she really loved it, loved the food. <laughs> <laughs> and when I, I mean, if we go onto the Luminato website, we sort of read the history. The way that you <coughs> tell the history as an organization is that the two founders got together and one was very interested 
in building the brand of the city as a place for artists, as a place for creativity. And one of the founders was very interested in both welcoming immigrant communities and, and newer members of the community and celebrating the cultures that they brought yeah. with them. How do those, I mean, both, how do those enter into your thinking? And how do you think Luminato has done against I mean, I think for any festival, it is important that you're rooted in the city and that your energy comes sort of from the city. And it's actually fun that this picture is just coming out because um, we announced today that we're going to do the entire festival in this space in 2016. So we're going to turn this decommissioned power plant from 1980, uh, or it was decommissioned in 1980. It's three times the size of the Tate Modern, and you can put the Statue of Liberty upright in it and we're going to do the entire festival in there. We're going to turn it into the largest multi-arts center in the world, temporarily. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth but, wants a commission. But, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I was just thinking that one. I have to go home and see if I still have some money in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't be the last thing on the line. <laughs> I know, I was just, I was like, Jesus. So we're building a theater in there, we're building a music stage in there, we're going to have you know, club, nightclubs in there, we're going to have a restaurant in there. Um, actually, we're gonna have an extremely high class French brasserie there with frog legs and, uh, and uh, because that's what the chef wants to do in this environment. We're gonna have a campground there on the site so people can camp in there. I'm thinking about bringing up our airstream and actually sleeping, staying basically right. there. We're going to have an um, eight hour overnight <laughs> concert where people can come and rent a cot and basically sleep there and listen to music. So we're basically sort of creating the largest, you know, cave in the world where everyone can come together and experience art and music uh, uh, together and nothing is separated, none of the art forms are separated. And I think, you know, to me, this is something that hopefully, you know, will really create a, a big impulse into the city of Toronto and in them thinking about you know what is art, where do we want to go? Because Toronto is the city that is sort of constantly uh, on the cusp of breaking through to become a global city. And sometimes I don't really know if it's just a permanent cuspness or whether it will actually um, you know sort of take that next step. And um, I think that this is an incredible space that we as sort of makers of art are really obliged to um, show the city what they can do with it and sort of be on the forefront you know, of that development in a way. Let me just take a quick poll. How many people have been to Toronto? How many people have been to Luminato? How many are gonna go to Luminato after this? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> now, Daniel, you're sort of by your job, a professional code switcher, among other things, code, code switcher. switcher. You need to translate sort of artist, developer, developer, yes. artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just heard Jorn talk about the power plant and what's gonna happen there. People are gonna be um, sleeping overnight and there's gonna be food being prepared and all sorts of craziness is gonna go in. You've gotta sit down and talk about experiences like that mm -hmm. to someone who cares a lot about egress, who cares a lot about liability, who cares a lot about all of these other issues that are involved when you're coming in and doing a master plan when you're doing all these other things. How do you begin doing that translation? How do you take something like the vision that Jorn had and begin talking about that with developers, with designers, with, with folks that are not necessarily approaching it from an artistic point of view? Yeah, I suppose we straddle that space b between that create that strong creativity and then the, the problems of delivering that and convincing the people that are paying the money or allowing audiences to come or in, in, in encouraging that creative activity to happen. They want to know it's safe, they want to know it can be delivered, they want to know um, that people will visit. So, that, that, you know, you know that, is, that is part of what we do. But, you know, we, we also connect artists to those creative opportunities. So, you know, we're very interested in, you know, niche parts of uh, those projects uh, as well. So, um, how do you create that human connection on a site that's being built? How do you engage people um, in that space? How do you encourage them to visit? You know, we 
put artists, we look for artists that can be put into projects um, that can add value, whether it's a project in you know, the Middle East, in the middle of the desert, whether it's in China, in one of these emerging cities, or whether it's in a very established space like New York. So we're all the time looking for that creative talent to deliver into projects. And I'm guessing that you've worked I'm guessing that you probably have worked at the largest scale of any of us in terms of the master planning that you're doing. I mean, some of the sites that you've been brought in are massive, yeah. very much approach city, to what we're city doing. Wide city sites, wide. Yeah. How do you begin talking about the kind of work you do at that scale? How is it different than when you're talking about that specific hallway or that crane apparatus or that basement? I think you, you naturally have to talk at a, at a much um, higher level in terms of how commissions might happen through a space, the, the time frame that they might happen as the community grows. You know, it might take 10, 20 years for that master plan to unfold. Um, I think that the, um, but you always have to bring it back to the particular. You know, we are, you know, each of one of us is an individual. We all live in an apartment, in a house somewhere. We all live in a city. We all need something to connect us to that place. So that particular thing, even though it's a master plan, it's about that human connection, human experience. You know, that's what we want to get to. But at that, at that broader scale, you're obviously, you know, planning a project and looking for the future. That's great. Um, Elizabeth, let me pick up on the human connection bit. And you and I have been on stage before and I've done this to you before. Um, I, I come out of the very traditional art, nonprofit arts and culture world. And I say this with love, as I would talk <laughs> about my own family to my family. But I think the traditional performing arts model is the model of the church or the cathedral, right? Which is there's the sacred thing we do. We do it at an anointed time, be it 7.30 on a Tuesday or 10 a.m. on a Sunday. And we will keep doing that if there's one person in the audience or there's a thousand. And I think there are many arts organizations that don't work this way. You were one of the first artists that I've ever met who instead of using that language of the cathedral, began talking about the space that you have in Brooklyn as a 7-Eleven, as a neighborhood convenience that I could stop in anytime I wanted and get something I needed. How did you sort of come out of that very sort of high church of the ballet world, which is where you began as a 12 year old, like no, many I, 12 I was 17. Or 17. It wasn't ballet. Right, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, late Including ballet. Right. And then you ended up right. in the sort of seven, talk about that journey. How did you well, sort of figure out your relation to people in the city? I mean, first I want to introduce my co-managing directors, Kathy Einhorn and Susan Myers, and we've been working They're together. Nice. They're the ones. That's how I did it, right? There's a huge vision of how do you squat on the property that uh, isn't for rent? You know, how do you call an unlikely number that's on the side of a building, and you don't even know who they are, but someone said that was the underground mayor of Williamsburg. I kept calling this guy, and what do you want? You know, I want, I've got this dance the company, you know. I don't want to hear it. I don't. And finally, he took me to slam. But it wasn't for rent. There was storage in there. Anyway, long story and short. And how many people have been to slam? folks know what SLAM is. It is a space that Elizabeth was able to build out to her specifications in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It's, it's a great lab for action mechanics. Thank you. It's a lab. It's always open to the public, so you're welcome. There's an audition tomorrow if any of you are interested in uh, uh, coming. In the um, wheel? No, that's a very special piece of oh, equipment. Okay. Can't, it, yeah, the practitioners can't choose their equipment. You have to. Well, so I, I, I tried to ask really critically. I didn't want to be, um, you know, an artist that kept begging for money anymore. I had gotten it for 30 years, and I thought, all right, what do I have that people want? Do I have any, is there any relevance to what we're doing to the general person out there in, in the street walking by? And uh, I had already, this would have been my seventh garage after I had to abandon my Soho loft, because we were, you know, I'm very proud of destroying that building, mm -hmm. and we had to leave. Um, because of the impact, if you don't know Strad. Physically destroyed. That's not a, that's not a metaphor. <laughs> it's not a metaphor. No. So, so um, we offered the bathrooms and the toilets first, and that it was a public place. You can walk in and wander around. And very viral, very word of mouth. We put kids action, 
circus and strap as sort of the incubation there in a Petri dish and watched it grow one cell, one little bubble up type of slime mold at a time. And it grew into a very vertically and, vert vertical and deep situation 13 years later. But as an artist, separate from, I still get philanthropic money. I can't really rest myself yet from that. But I want to be, I don't want to anymore. I want to go to market, but there is no vehicle for that in the art world. And I actually don't want to be curated anymore. You know, I, will, I, I, I was trying to think beforehand, what's an animal that has to, that is so, un, that is so wrangly, an animal maybe in a zoo, that has to have its very own cage? What would that be? Because it's not, not safe to be around that animal. And we want our very own cage. Now we own the lab, because the city bought it for us. And I think that the idea, you know, and I have deep respect for curators, don't get me wrong. Um, but I, when I was in Toronto, I'll speak out of turn, we were at the Pan Am Games this summer, and I wanted to be with you at the Luminato Festival, but my agent did whatever. Um, but I think that the new model for art, artists who have gotten to a certain place in the field, I don't want to wait around for a phone call. I just don't want to. And, and that doesn't mean that I wouldn't accept an invitation. But I think we have more agency than that. And we can place our stuff in places that we choose by getting partnerships maybe with urban planners, developers, construction workers, et cetera. Um, I'm not sure what the roadmap is, but. So let's, let me pick up on, on the infrastructure piece that I wanted to, to get at a little, because I was really interested, I think it was Richard on the previous panel, who was sort of saying that we need to provide infrastructure and let people innovate on that. And there's a really interesting study that I'm sure many people have read of one block of Green Street in Lower Manhattan, and it's looked at that one block over 300 years. And essentially the takeaway is no brilliant planner, no brilliant government official can guess what is gonna happen next in that space. No one would have predicted that. And that the most important thing that a city government could do is provide basic infrastructure and then let individuals, be they artists, be they developers, be they entrepreneurs, innovate on top of that. So what is the basic infrastructure that an artist needs to engage with space in our city, be it privately owned public space, be it truly public space? What is sort of the basic level that we need so that Elizabeth could do something on it, so that Yorn could program on it, so you could bring an artist in? What are some of the nuts and bolts pieces? And I'm interested in anything from electricity to permitting to column-free space. What, what do you think about as you think about space? I think about it more in the artistic process, too. They need <coughs> financial support and time and space to make their work. So, um, which is the notion of, you know, we're a city of building a lot of buildings to present a lot of work, but I wonder where the work is coming from to fill those buildings. I wonder where the support for the artists starting out mid-career or later career artists are going to get their support from to actually make the work that are filling all of these buildings we're building. So that we're not just a city of presenters, but we're a city of artists that make work that gets seen here. Um, but I think there are certain basic things, you know, you need, you need power, power, power everywhere. Um, you need uh, dressing room space, you need private room space, you need um, I, you know what, artists, I think, I, I don't know, I don't know how to, I think it depends on what you're talking about. I think artists can present under any situation in any way, in any form. I think um, that's the challenge that artists are best faced with and that's when we've tried to noodle through some situations where we think we don't quite know how to animate the space, the first people we'll go to are artists that we feel confident can uh, figure, figure it out and figure in ways that we would have never thought about. And uh, in, in very simple, sometimes in more simple ways. But you know, I think it's, it's a lot of it's just the financial backing. I think a lot of it is the um, hand-holding support. And a lot of it is um, having the time and space to make the work. Bjorn, what would you add to that? What are the things that Toronto has that allow Luminato to happen there? And what are the things you wish Toronto had that would allow Luminato 2.0 to happen there? Not 2.0. I mean, maybe to sort of start with what do artists need, and I, I, I love what Liz said that 
you know, she goes into a space and it was not the question of what is the value I'm adding here, but you know, she, she goes somewhere and, and, and does it because she wants to do it. And I think artists really don't need anything. You know, I think the more you leave them alone, the better it is. I mean, the reason why, the reason why New York exploded in the 60s is because smart people deregulated Soho and let artists live and work in spaces that were abandoned by factories. That was the one thing, and you know, Jack Smith didn't have a bathroom, so he went to someone else. So we went to a friend and, and, and showered there every day. But they had very, very, very little. And that is what created the greatest freedom. And I think that is, that is what I'm trying to do all the time with the artists. We don't have anything at the Herm. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, there's no power there. There's no water there, so we have to bring it in somehow. But that creates challenges, and it also creates other ways of, of dealing with it in a way. Um, and I think, you know, really the, the better it is, the more freedom we are able to provide for artists, the less we talk to them about, you know, what is the result that we're hoping, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to try to make artists create something that I have in my head or that someone else might have in their head. Because I really strongly believe it's the artists that need to lead. And it's not, they shouldn't be thinking about what value are they adding to something. If we don't have art, we don't exist as human beings, as human society. You know, we have people destroying art all over the place, and those are barbarians. So, Daniel, I mean, picking up on that, I mean, Jorn has said nothing, right? We don't need anything. We shouldn't design spaces to anticipate what artists are going to do. And yet your day job is designing spaces to anticipate what artists are going to do. So How do you sort of design freedom? You can't, <laughs> you, you can't design freedom. So, right. like, and the artists you bring on site and commission, you say, oh, we've got a plinth here to put your artwork on. And they're like, I want to climb down from the roof over there. So, you, you know, the point, you know, the idea of putting infrastructure in is, I think it's a different infra infrastructure. I think Brookfield Properties have put Deborah in place. That's the infrastructure you need. Well, you I need to doing, embed. If you're doing performing art, it's very different, potentially, than visual art. So I think a lot of it is it's the ongoing programming. If you're going to have the New York City Ballet come in, they certainly have a different need for infrastructure than another, you know. Absolutely. Right. That's true. That's true. So I think, but I think, I think clients are probably planning their open space. Um, the forward-thinking developers are putting in open space that can be utilised, connecting power to it. I mean, those things are almost everyday activities now for for uh, uh, projects like Hudson Yard. Um, but I think you know our best friends in uh, the developer um, space, are the marketing team, the branding team that they understand that the needs of um, creativity in, in their development and adding that, um, you know, that very human connection and, um, and allowing um, that to happen. Uh, we engage with public spaces all the time and you just have to work with that team to um, uh, deliver that art outcome. And it can be a temporary installation, it can be a permanent installation. It might need a crane to lift a cast bronze, you know, sculpture over a five-story building. Or you might just need a team of five dancers to bring up an inflatable um, piece that'll be there for a day. So um, I, think, I think the infrastructure is human infrastructure within the organization. And that, you know, that need of that organization to add that value to their public spaces. Um, Elizabeth, in architecture, some of the least successful rooms and spaces that are designed are those that are multi-purpose. They're designed to be multi-purpose, right? It actually tends to be more successful to design a theater and also let it be used for other spaces. You're now at a point where you sort of want to inhabit already built spaces. You want to look at the city, you want to find the space that you want to put action on. What are you looking for? What captures you? What excites you as an artist when you look out this window? Well, tower cranes. <laughs> and then I was in a town, it was probably Blacksburg, Virginia, and I, I was always wondering as I'm making all these drawings, uh, how fast do they go around? You know, 
And then this cow crane had a load of cement on it. It was going like this. It was huge. I was like, very fast. <laughs> Good to know. But I also want to introduce Andrea Woodner, who's my board president, but also the founder of Design Trust. And I think we talk all the time about what makes, and I think this room was talking all the time about what makes a great city, you know, buildings and infrastructure and public spaces. And I know that it's also partnerships. And one of the reasons I was one of those early inhabitants in Soho, and we got a five-year lease with rats, I just wanted to say. It was toilet, because I put a toilet in. But then the law law got passed and we were, ended up being in court for 18 years. And what really made it work for us to stay there was our relationship with this 85-year-old landlord, who at the point, after, after being there for 20 years, he, we liked each other. Same for Brooklyn. Like Doug Steiner came and built the property out. I, I, I feel that when we looked at each other, I was in his way. I was in their way in Soho. And I think artists need more than bathrooms. We need space. And I really believe we need to own the space. And I think that that happens first. And then I can make whatever I want, even if it's just as a two by four. If, if you can't invent in a public space that is yours, then it's not like Dumbo and Two Trees, where you know Jed Valentis and David gave every artist all this space, but then they took it back. And every business person knows when you're building a business and 15, 10 years goes by, you don't want to have to move. So my belief is it's relationships, and it's not the studios and universities that still have hardwood floors, ballet bars, a piano, and you have to take your shoes off and leave the stuff of life at the door. Like, what are you ever going to invent in there? Same for theaters. It's pretty, it's pretty impossible to have a theater that's useful and doesn't deaden people's experience because they have to go in there, sit down in the dark, be quiet, not eat, mostly. So I, I guess I, I don't have an answer, yeah, well, no, really, and, except and for the tower that, cranes. I mean, cranes. tower cranes. So do we know any tower crane operators in the city? I think this is the room where we can get you some if you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> But there's some, I mean, there's something very interesting about the four of you being on stage at this Municipal Art Society event, which in many ways is about permanence, in many ways is about the built environment, in many ways is about decisions which are going to last 50, 100, 150 years. And each of you, what I've mostly heard you talk about is temporary, is the ephemeral, is the thing that only happens once. So talk, talk for a minute about permanence and transience. Talk about how the sort of fleeting moment can animate a permanent space. Talk about that relationship, because I think that's really interesting. And we can go in the same order, we can popcorn it, as oh meeting God. designers like to say. Oh, well that's, uh, I'm gonna think about it, I have to think about it. Bjorn, do you want to? Well, I, I mean, in the festival world, obviously you don't, you know, I, I don't necessarily think about permanence, because I am there to, impress within you know my 10 17 or whatever long days and i think i mean permanence you can also create in people's minds and in their memory you know i think to me some of the most amazing public artworks uh um or performances or whatever i haven't even seen you know i think philippe petit walking across the world trade center uh, you know i think that's one of the most amazing public performance pieces, you know, in history, basically. And it did not have a commissioner, it did not have a curator attached to it, and I think that's what's really great, you know? And his piece so much embodies also what this is about. He made that step into the void where there was nothing, you know? I mean, that's sort of how you were. Yeah. And uh, or another amazing example is, and I didn't really like, uh, um, oh God, what's the guy that's, no, 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 covering all the buildings. <laughs> all the <laughs> covering the buildings with this. <laughs> yes, Chris. Oh my goodness, I'm so embarrassed. Sorry. I have a little bit of a cold and it obviously affects my brain. Um, but he covered the Reichstag in Berlin for 10 days and it was, it changed Germany. It really, you know, it completely changed the mentality, not only for those 10 days, but it really sort of made Germany actually possible as a reunited city. And the amazing thing about Christo is too, he doesn't have a commissioner, he doesn't have a curator, he doesn't have accept any public funding, he doesn't accept any sponsorship, any donations. He pays for the, the thing completely himself by making art and selling it. 
And I think that is really fascinating. And, um, you know, so I think you also, I hope that what we're doing at the Hearn this year or next year is going to create permanence in people's heads. If it's not maybe going to be, or, and maybe sometimes also things might lead to permanence, you know. So I think that is, um, that is an I interesting kind of a way to, uh, to think about it as well. Deborah. You know, I think about the permanence versus the temporary in terms of, um, you know, sort of the old-fashioned notion of the 1% for art or mm -hmm. the whatever percent for art program, which we sometimes deal with when we do a redesign. Because a, a lot of... A percent of a building project is set aside for work of art that's usually a statue plopped in front of it. Which is usually you know, a statue right. plopped in a bad place. Dude on a nobody, horse with a sword. Or nobody can see it. Right. And it's, you know, it's not even labeled. Um, and so how we pay our due respect to these, but you know, like many things, do they stand the test of time? And right. Often the answer is no, they don't. Right. But you can't get rid of them, so you have to be very creative in how you recite them. Um, but I think that is the, that is the challenge of, of permanent art. When everyone talks about using technology and technology and permanent art, and I think, well, that's in 10 years, is that even gonna be relevant? Is that gonna look really, really dated in 10 years? where I think some of the greatest works of art from you know, 3,000 years ago well, are timeless. So it's, I know it's very subjective, but I really think that art cannot be plunked down as a 1% and it cannot be decor. You, you can't have people making the decisions about putting what goes in, in, on the walls uh, and on the plazas be it look like it's part of the decor, because then it is part of the decor mm -hmm. and no one will notice it. And then what's the point of it? If it doesn't provoke some kind of acknowledgement at the minimal, if not actually thinking about it, wanting to know more about this artist and their work, time to pause, a time to have coffee around it, a time to reflect, then really what's the purpose of it? It serves absolutely no purpose. And I think there's, uh, uh, I don't think there's enough thought put into that process. I think, you know, when you go to Millennium Park in Chicago, obviously the Anish Kapoor, I, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing, but that's not the kind of scale that most developers can work on. Daniel, how do you think about, Im how do you plan impermanence? I think um, you make sure that, uh, we make sure our clients and our projects, you know, our clients understand the nature of needing to investigate public space. So, you know, in these new world cities that we're developing in the Middle East, in China, um, the developers want to have everything that they see in New York or um, they see somewhere else in the world in Europe. And, you know, we've been shown projects and they show Battery Park and they want that and they, they think they can plunk it down in Qatar. Um, I think, um, you know, the public art policy of, you know, 1% and 2%, you see, you know, these cities, Toronto, Melbourne in, in Australia, they have a public artwork on every corner of one, one intersection. And they have been, you know, commissioned by each building, each developer of each building on each corner. And they don't have a site in the city landscape. They don't have a connection to the people. Um, and they became, become meaningless very quickly. Um, Arnie Quinns is a fantastic artist, builds temporary timber installations. He was commissioned to put a piece on a bridge in Lyon, I think, in France. And, you know, he put that piece up after a lot of negotiation with the city. Um, the people of that city did not want one of their key, you know, crossing points of the river to be closed down for three months because, you know, it would take them longer to get to work. Um, they couldn't drive the car across the bridge. Um, the work was installed for three months and then the people didn't want to pull down. So <laughs> it, yeah, they were happy to drive that extra 10 minutes. They were happy to walk across the bridge. It became this center of community activity. And so, you know, that's the fantastic thing about temporary installations and that process of investigation of space or questioning how that space is used now and how it might be used in the future. So, you know, even in these huge new developments, we need those spaces where people can, you know, question that space and activate it and engage in a different way. Elizabeth, you work at a, time, at a scale of time that most of us can't conceive. When you're creating a piece, 
what is the unit of time that you're tending to think in? How, how quickly are you thinking? Well, if I could do everything, the entire duration, you mean, in less than a second, I would do it. <laughs> if I could condense time so that everyone experiences action, I would split the seconds. So the temporality of the physicality is noticed and perceived, which I believe it's not. People pay attention to the body rather than shifting the subject to the action you're doing, which of course is invisible. So if you up the ante and you do go higher, faster, harder, sooner, the audience is like, in the non-predictive rhythm that comes out of that and our investigation into you know, what is the iambic pentameter of action, not music, not literature, not poetry. That's what I'm working on. And I, I, I agree with that. I also think that the temporary allows you to focus on a particular subject matter you know, that you may want to have a stronger focus on. So as an example, um, we did a wonderful installation with Mark Russell as part of the Under the Radar series several years ago with a, a Birmingham-based theater company called Stance Cafe, and they did of all the people in the world, where they did installations in rice. And so people had relative numbers of, uh, so we had a giant pile of how many people watched the um, finale of American Idol, and it was a giant pile of rice, and then Billy Idol was one piece of rice, and then how many billionaires there were in the world, and then how many people uh, lived in poverty in the world, and then you could go up to them, it was a theater company, you could go up to them and they would measure, answer, you could ask them a question, they would measure it out in rice, and it was installed for two weeks, and it happened over real time. So it happened during the last Democratic pr uh, primary selection, so as that was going on, uh, Ben Zarbuto was assassinated and it addressed it addressed that, it kept, it, it mixed contemporary news with issues in front of American Express, it's a funny thing, we had um, piles of rice that showed how many people worked at American Express globally, how many cab drivers were in the world, they also tried to bring it down to New York. So how many cab drivers were in New York, how many school teachers were in New York, and so I got a call from somebody in corporate communications from American Express saying, you know, we didn't give you permission to use that statistic, and I said, well, it's on the front page of your website. <laughs> I didn't think I really needed your permission to use it. He said, oh, okay, I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay, all, right. Excellent. all right, so I think we have time for one or two questions from the audience. We have microphones roaming. There's a hand immediately back here, our most eager audience member, and then Bobby absolutely gets a second question. First question in the back. Okay, hi. Um, and just say a word about who you are. Oh, I'm Elise Bernhardt, and back in the day, I started dancing in the streets, and I've no, some, some, two of those women and I go back a long time. And uh, I, I think probably the thing I'm most proud of in my life is getting Elizabeth Streb to perform on the boardwalk at Coney Island. Um, because, and this was maybe my comment slash question, there's a lot of talk about space, engaging space, working in community, and I think only rarely has it been talked about that the engagement with the people on the ground is really, I mean, Elizabeth, you talked a little bit about relationships with your landlord or with the guy who owns the, but the relationship with the people who are watching and how, how we construct a situation where people feel comfortable engaging with artists as well as the, the, the other side of that relationship, artists engaging with people around them is a really important piece of how you allow the transient to be repetitive. <laughs> Continue to make a space and an atmosphere and an ambiance that's encouraging so that people feel like they're part of the experiment. And there's certain artists who do that really well and others need more help with it. Liz Elizabeth and I can talk about a process. I think one of the things that's really interesting about doing visual or performing art in public spaces is we obviously can engage with an incredibly diverse audience, but it's also we lift the curtain back on process. So every rehearsal, every tech rehearsal, every dry run, uh, an artist making their work, making is all done in public space and, very, and people in our public spaces are very engaged by the process and you see especially the workers who sometimes the tenants in our own building are the hardest people to break the routine, stop and pay attention to what's going on in their very own building. When you start doing process and people are uh, realizing how stuff is happening 
and being made, they get very bonded to it and then they want the payoff, which is also very interesting because that's how we built our audiences. And Elizabeth, you want to talk about your residency? Yeah, you can. Well, I wasn't, it was before my time, so you oh, talk about it. Time. I, yeah, that was not a ticket. Go for it. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> oh. Uh, well, we were installed in, the, I'm, I call it the Winter Garden, right by those gorgeous glass <coughs> things for uh, uh, three weeks, my entire company, we were building a show. And I know I was going to mention, in terms of Elise's comment, the stain of art. It was the first time I realized all the businessmen stood way far away from me. I look a little like I look now, but little, I look a little more radical now. But I had, never mind. Um, and they come up, and I could tell, just as a human animal to a human, a snakes in the grass, I could tell, wow, they're, they don't think they can talk to me. This is a serious problem. And I think it was the first time we really were in public space making stuff. And I realized, and I still, now, now SLAM is always open to the public, so that, that means you as an artist who's, you know, if you're lucky to keep surviving, um, you're elevated to an ivory tower type thing, but when you open the doors, you get the thing you used to get when you were a nobody young person, uh, trying to be an artist, and you get interruption and strangers. And the inflection of that, which happened at the Winter Garden, and continued to happen when we were in Grand Central Terminal and on the streets in various ways in Coney Island, it, it still made me realize that you, know, you can build things in the high-bred, not-for-profit, um, you know, ivory tower world. The vocabularies and the grammars can be reassembled and you know, just to try and dispense with the cliches that we built up in a particular name, language. But then you have to reconstruct them and go public. Go to the real world, this is America. We need to get the other 300 million people to care about what we're doing, and that needs a distribution system. And I, I'm figuring $2 million, if anyone wants to invest in that venture. And just, and the one thing that I'll just say very flat-footedly, and we'll come to Bobby's question, is both when you're talking about developing spaces, and when you're talking about art, making it free and outdoors is not necessarily an invitation to everyone. That's not enough. It's about the curation. So it's about the curation, it's about the invitation, it's about a number of other things. But I think unpacking all of that is important. And just say a word for the two people who don't know who you are. I'm Barbara Paley, hi. And recently on the MAS board, so come and join our journey. Uh, my question for each of you is, what do you want to do next? Where, what fantasy do you have that you want to realize? Tower cranes. <laughs> Tower cranes. I stick to my guns. Damn it. Anything, you have a magic wand, money, space, physics, or no object. What do you do? I, th I think a, a commissioner that understands <coughs> the length of time it needs to generate a, a strong and integrated public art program. Like it's a 30 year, 50 year strategy. It's not a one-year, two-year delivery program. That's never going to... Don't give that to me. <laughs> Great. So, Crane, a five-decade commitment. <laughs> and What's I had a lot of time to think about it, so you'd think it would be something... Uh, finally growing successfully an artichoke in my garden. <laughs> I, was I, was <laughs> I was just at a convening yesterday where someone said that horticulture is the slowest of the performing arts. <laughs> That's my new favorite quote. Deborah, horticulture, um, horticulture. <laughs> the slowest of the time. I would have a gigantic, three times the size of the Tate laboratory for artists and it. scientists and teachers, and I would house a elementary school where art was at the center of the curriculum, and I would have, see what comes out of it. Let's do it for two weeks. Let's do it for two weeks at the festival. See we what comes space. out of it. <laughs> we have some space. So, I was going to say, so the closing <laughs> sentence of the <laughs> MAS panel is everyone go to there. Toronto. Yes. That's exactly what you wanted out of it. So with that, please join me in thanking all four of our panelists. How wonderful. Well, as you can see, that what we started talking about, the intersection of place and people, you've just witnessed. And um, I just want to thank all of the panelists and participants this afternoon, giving us such a stimulating conversation. I know there have been sound bites all through it, you know, this place book idea. I love that, that Omid said, art is cheaper than security. Yeah. I want that one. Um, and then this idea that um, uh, things that might lead to permanence. I mean, we're all, I see this in city building all the time. I'm so interested to hear um, my artist colleagues saying the same thing. 
So again, thanks to all the partners, the Milstein School, to Lindsay Galen and Kate Carrigan, who couldn't be with us, and Chris and her colleague, um, to Brookfield, who's been with us through this whole journey and helping us develop the program. And, and we want to congratulate you again for the Livable City Award, which MAS gives on very, very precious occasions. So we're happy to be celebrating you and to have Deborah here, who's really been in, in, at the center of that program with her colleague, Melissa, and Anita Contini, your predecessor before you. Um, it's been wonderful. And then the other sponsors that helped us uh, underwrite this event, Tish and Spire, um, AVNI, the Association for Better New York, the city of Cardiff, Wales. Who's here from Wales? I just love that they cut us a check. Hmm? They couldn't make it, but do, can, do you not love that, that the city of Cardiff said they wanted to throw into the hat on this? That's wonderful. And then DCA, our own Department of Cultural Affairs. And then we have artists with us, as I mentioned. So upstairs, we're gonna see Maria Pucciarelli, um, from Dangers Among Us and Jordan Manor, the photographer, um, who, and they'll be up there and there are drinks up there. And then the last thing I just want to say is that we have a wonderful production staff at MAS that produces these events weekly, often, uh, certainly monthly. We had our big summit, as I mentioned, a month ago. But I also just want to single out one person, which is Danielle Drought, who did all the programming and the logistics. Where is Danielle? Um, and who's just been fantastic. <laughs> So it really is about the captivating power of place. That's the business we're all in. Thank you so much for coming and being with us, and let's go upstairs and have a drink. Yeah.